Obviously, this talk is, is about raising monarchs, but it's also about creating the habitats that they need to survive in. So I'm going to touch a little on both, but I'm going to leave a lot of time because I think that some of my little exhibits here are very interesting. And we do have a young lady here in this cage who is dying to get out and fly away. In fact, I, I covered her up so she wouldn't be too distressed. And, uh, and, but we will, we will have a reveal at the proper moment and, and uh, wish her well in her travels. So um, people often ask me how long it takes to get, you know, different butterflies have different life cycle times. And there are uh, many butterflies who actually go into chrysalis uh, in the fall and emerge in the spring, but uh, the monarch life cycle is surprisingly short. We have uh, um, from the total thing from from the initial egg to the adult emerging or eclosing, as butterfly aficionados uh, call it, uh, is is a 20 to 32 day process, or a little bit longer if it's cooler. 20 days is about as fast as it goes if the weather is very warm. Monarchs, you've heard about their journey, I'm sure most of you, if you're here. Uh, but it, it, it still amazes me to think that these tiny creatures on these frail wings travel thousands of miles. They can travel 150, fly 150 miles a day. Uh, the black lines, the veins in their wings are what gives them um, the, uh, it, it serves as a compass. They create magnetic fields that allow the, the uh, butterflies to stay on course. There are monarchs that don't migrate. And there are monarchs in other parts of the world, too. Uh, so, uh, but our monarchs, if you see a monarch flying around in your garden in Connecticut, you are looking at the population that migrates. The ones, uh, and they are going to migrate uh, down to uh, Mexico. Uh, there is a non-migratory population that starts in Florida and stays in Florida, and another one that starts in California and stays in California. And you may have heard uh, in the Times that because of the wildfires and everything, the California population is teetering on the brink. Uh, our population is also um, under, under a great deal of stress and threat. The eastern monarch populations have plummeted. And this is, how they, this is what they track. So they don't count the individual monarchs. They count the areas, the overwintering areas that occur down in Mexico, where all the butterflies cluster. They count the number of hectares which have cluster, masses of butterfly populations up in the mountains in this one special tree, the Oyamel fir tree, which is a grandiose tree like a redwood, um, illegal logging, all kinds of things happen to threaten their population once they get down there. But you can see this is not a good trend line. Um, the most recent numbers, uh, uh, so 2.1 hectares. OK, so that is, think of that as massed monarchs, 2.1 hectares. Well, that's the size of a city block. That's what's left. And it used to be. 18 hectares as it, at its high point. So we're talking about a vanishingly small uh, number in their population. Of course, there are millions in that hectare, but still not a lot when you're thinking about the entire um, eastern half of the US feeding this population. So um, the triple threat. Climate change should not be a surprise, uh, considering the kind of weather we've been witnessing this summer. Um, habitat loss. So habitat loss happens uh, in Mexico with illegal lawing of the fir trees, where they take refuge in the winter. And it also happens when milkweed is scarce in fields and roadsides in the US. Of course, the reason milkweed is scarce in fields where it used to be plentiful is largely due to GMOs. So um, what that means is short course on GMOs when corn, for example, is modified to withstand Roundup. That means they can spray Roundup over an entire field and the corn doesn't die. We get to eat that. But the milkweed does die. 
So where, whereas milkweed used to always grow around the edges of fields and things like that, and in the Midwest you could see, I mean, monarchs were the most common butterfly in America when I was a kid, watching them fly around in the Midwest. Uh, and uh, that's why you've seen a 90% decline in their population, is because their habitat is being lost and their milkweed. Um, and uh, so uh, if you buy organic corn, you know it hasn't been sprayed with Roundup. So we can't afford to lose these beautiful creatures. I mean, they're not a food crop. Uh, they, they are beautiful, and I think of them as the poster child for a lot of things that need protecting through uh, more diverse habitats that we can create in our backyards. So I'm going to tell you some simple things tonight, some steps that you can take. You don't have to go full on like I do and raise them, but you can do this in your own garden. So the first piece of news, this is the one thing you can't really change, is you need to find a spot in your yard that gets six hours of sunlight. Um, and uh, that is because the, the flowers that do best at attracting pollinators and monarchs uh, are sun lovers for the most part. So you got pick, pick a spot. You will be disappointed if you try to do this in the shade. Make your garden monarch friendly. Um, a lot of emphasis is placed on natives, and I, not least of which by me, but I do mention that annual flowers provide nectar. And there, it's important to include them too because you want a continuous supply of nectar. And the most dedicated gardener who is just growing perennials is challenged to have something blooming in the garden that produces nectar every day of the summer. So to fill in with those gaps and particularly to feed that, those hungry hordes that come through in the fall, plant these things, um, marigold, zinnias, Mexican sunflower, uh, Cleome, Cosmos, Ageratum, these are good plants, beloved of, of pollinators, they don't do bad things, and they will help sustain your garden. But perennials, to provide nectar, is equally uh, uh, vital uh, to not just to monarchs but to uh, many other uh, species of, of insect and pollinator. And these are just, these are a few of my favorites to get you that succession of bloom. Uh, asters are real powerhouses in the fall. Uh, Anis hyssop is a good powerhouse through the main part of the summer. Anis hyssop is in the mint family and the deer don't like it, has a square stem. In general, anything with a square stem is in the mint family and the deer don't like it. So if, like me, you have a lot of deer snacking in your yard, get your anise hyssop in there, get your bee balm, your monarda in there, um, then you'll have something uh, for our friends, uh, the pollinators, to enjoy uh, while the deer are snacking on uh, uh, the roses or what have you. Um, so these are, these are, and by the way, I did provide this whole presentation is available in a PDF that um, uh, Amanda will be happy to send you after the fact so nobody has to remember all these lists that I'm spouting out at you. So the next thing you want, let's see, here we go. Um, important point, no pesticides. There is no point in luring things into your creatures, into your garden, if you turn around and nuke them with pesticides. So you have to go organic. Uh, no pesticides, fungicides, herbicides. Uh, uh, you will see milkweed bugs visiting your milkweed plants. If they bug you, you can squish them off or hose them off. Um, they aren't really harming the monarchs. They will uh, suck the juice out of the seed pod, so you may not have as viable seeds as a result, but they aren't really harming the monarchs. And uh, there is a this is a very interesting book. This is called Milkweed Monarchs and More, and this shows the entire community of creatures that lives on milkweed, and it's quite eye-opening. So it isn't just monarchs. Um, so also butterfly-friendly features are um, a, little, a little water bath. Not, you know, maybe if you have a very shallow bird bath or if you just have a little puddle in the corner of your garden uh, because they like to come and get, they get minerals from the, from the puddle uh, in the mud, and um, 
Uh, you also want to uh, give them shelter from wind and predators. If you've got a nice big flower garden, you're giving them shelter. So that's, that's good. So um, this is about your milkweed varieties. I'm going to go quick over this so that I have more time to talk about the creatures. But uh, milkweed varieties, this is a, stale, a stalwart. This is a very good plant to have um, in your garden. And uh, it uh, doesn't spread in a, in a wanton way. It has, they come in a, they're a beautiful pink variety. And uh, it's called Asclepius incarnata. That's the scientific name, but it's swamp milkweed. Um, it also has a beautiful white flower, and they're blooming right now. They're in bloom, and I have uh, monarchs visiting. I have a male monarch who has decided that this is his milkweed, and no one else can be on it except a female. Um, and uh, that means he's chasing. They're very territorial, the males are. And I see him every day. I can tell because he's got a little tatter on his wing. And he is chasing the wasps off because it's his milkweed. This is interesting because the wasps are predators of little caterpillars. So while he's being territorial for his own purposes, he's also helping protect the baby caterpillars that might be on there that might get eaten by. So I find that rather interesting. I had a male last year who actually took on a hummingbird. He lost. The hummingbird was like, nope. <laughs> you know, buzzed after him. He took off, went and sulked in a tree for a while. So it is fun. You know, they, they, it is interesting to see their little habits. So anyway, uh, swamp milkweed is uh, easy, readily available in, in the nurseries that sell natives, uh, such as right down the street here, the garden center. I know they, uh, they carry uh, um, swamp milkweed. And uh, I tell you, the terms for milkweed kind of put you off. No, you don't have to have a swamp to grow this stuff. Uh, it's perfectly happy in ordinary uh, garden conditions. Um, now, common milkweed. This is the stuff with the great big leaves that you see growing um, maybe along the roadside. And uh, I do not invite this stuff into my garden. It has rhizomes and it's quite aggressive. At Wakeman Town Farm, um, where I am the garden's chair. We have a lot of milkweed that we let grow along the fence line and all kinds of things like that. And, and uh, it's quite beloved monarchs, but it just, so if you have a kind of a scruffy place or a meadow area in your yard, consider this, but don't expect it to behave nicely in your pretty English cottage garden. J j you know, it, get one of the other polite ones that I'm going to show you, uh, like the swamp. Because it, it spreads by rhizomes and it, is, it can be aggressive. So, uh, northeast natives, butterfly weed, you may know this. Okay, so butterfly weed comes in orange or um, yellow. Uh, is, uh, orange is the native color, yellow is, is a, um, um, a cultivar, but it is kind of pretty. And uh, the, it's not their favorite to eat. Mama doesn't lay her eggs on this anywhere near as often as she does the other varieties of milkweed. And uh, when I feed my caterpillars with butterfly weed, they're kind of like, mm, mm, not so much. They'll eat it if they're hungry, and, I, and, and if it's all they get, they'll eat it just fine. But it's not their favorite. I think it's because it's got little hairs on the leaves. Anyway, but it's a very nice one for your garden. Uh, it does attract them, and you can put it in, it stays a little lower than some of the other varieties, so it's a nice one to put right along the edge. Uh, if you find these, you will probably enjoy having them in your garden. Um, so purple milkweed, I call it the purple princess. I tried for four years to get my um, purple uh, milkweed to, to bloom. And this year it finally took off. It was glorious. And I have pods too. And the seeds are very much in demand. So I'm excited that I have seeds from my purple milkweed. But this is, this is a gorgeous plant and it blooms the earliest. It was blooming in June. Very rich purple color. You can't go, the slide's a little washed out, but trust me, it's a gorgeous color. And then there's one that's called Eastern Swamp Milkweed. And um, Aztec Land Trust offered it as a, as, as a native, and they probably will again next spring. But you can get, um, uh, the, it's a subspecies of uh, the, the swamp milkweed, and it's, it's, uh, its name is pulchrum, which means beautiful. It is a very beautiful milkweed, and it's perfect for this area, so uh, really good one to grow. I grow a lot of it, and I brought some seeds, so if any of you guys are interested in it, I'd be happy to share some of my seeds with you afterwards. Um, some non-native annuals. 
And uh, Pete, there's there's some debate about this, and I will be upfront with you. So this is this is a, a seedling that I started myself, and this is what the bloom looks like, and it blooms its head off until frost. So this is just a seedling, so it's not very big, but they uh, they provide a lot of food. And then there's another kind, which is uh, this is yes this is these two here um, this is what it looks like in uh, and then they, there's also a yellow one uh, that's Mexican and um, uh, if you lived in Texas I would tell you to cut this down to the ground uh, not let it overwinter but since you don't live in Texas, it's perfectly fine to grow it here, and the, the monarchs really like it. In fact, this teeny tiny plant already has two eggs on it, <laughs> so quite. Po I'll, I'll, you can get a. I'll let you have a look at at, at them afterwards. So um, quite quite popular with. Uh, so I always have some of this in my garden. Also, um, some of the other milkweeds get a little ratty toward the end of the season. They start to senesce, and this is still going strong. So it's nice to have something that's still blooming to provide them nectar on their journey south. And uh, um, this one, so this one is a really funny looking one. It has a pretty white blossom, hangs like a chandelier. Uh, and it's Gomphocarpus physicarpus comes from Africa. It does not overwinter here, uh, but it grows very easily from seed. And its, it's common name is hairy balls. And when you see the seed pod, you'll know why they, its common name is that. So anyway, uh, this, these are the two non-natives that I also grow from seed and have in my garden uh, just to help make sure. When you're raising cats, as I do, you can run out of uh, uh, milkweed because the, they'll eat you out of house and home when they get to the very hungry caterpillar stage. And so I uh, like to have sh make sure that I have extra plants and that these guys uh, provide that for me. Um, uncommon milkweeds, if you find these in your, in your nursery, buy them. Um, so I, I've been starting these from seed, and it's, it's, a, it's a labor of love. It was a challenge to find them and a challenge to grow them from seed. This is a very pretty little one, front of the border, very ladylike, little tiny um, fronds, sort of, and little tiny white blossoms. It's called whorled milkweed. This is, this is a rare one in that it, it likes shade a, a little bit. It'll take a little bit of shade. It's called poke milkweed. Also, these are all native to this area. This one, I got hold of a few precious plants, and I'm, try I'm trying to raise some enough to get pods uh, so that I can offer them to the public. And uh, this one, Varigata, same thing. I got a few precious seeds, and I'm trying to raise them so that I can uh, share, the, share the seeds with others. But all of these uh, are, you, I know that the growers are trying to get these going so that they can offer more varieties to the public. So if you see them, um, make, a, make a grower happy and buy some. Uh, so I'm on the hunt. The, my quest for, oh, we're starting to get sun there. Uh, my quest for red milkweed is uh, as yet unmet. I can't find these seeds anywhere, but I'm, I'm determined that I will someday. So um, growing milkweed, um, you, you mingle it with your nectar flowers. Don't have a big bunch of milkweed all by itself mingle it in together. It's safer for them that way, easier for them to hide from escape predators. Uh, in all of these links, you can follow them in, in the deck when you get it if you want more information than what I can give you here. And um, um, when you grow it, they will come. And I wanted to share with you, I hope you can see them. There's, uh, I had two two caterpillars. I named them Frick and Frack. They were egg mates. They were on a, hatched on a leaf together and they were inseparable. I'm not kidding. And they, when they decided to pupate, they got together side by side. They got in their J's and I was able to record. This is sped up a little bit, but they, they pupated together. So look how, see, see how it happens? They, when they're pupating, they they throw off their outer skin, which is just the black stripes. So this little looks like a wrinkled sock on the floor. Of the, so, so they do this, and then it's like they're pulling on a very tight pair of green stockings. Um, and uh, that whole process takes about an hour. Wow. It's so amazing. So that was, I called them Frick and Frack, because uh, they were inseparable. It's kind of a caterpillar joke, because um, the technical term for caterpillar poop is frass. 
So Frick and Frack were kind of aptly named. So this is, so then Frick and Frack, when they're ready to come out, this is what you see. The morning that they're going to come out, you, cut, you get up in the morning and what was green the night before has turned orange and black overnight. It's, it's so amazing. And so I knew these guys were ready to come out, so I got my camera set up. And they just, and they have to hang straight when they come out. Now, the, the light changed while this was going on, but you're going to see, here comes, here comes, the second one comes out. There we go. So they were together their whole way through. It was pretty amazing. So these little guys, um, and uh, up here, that's the one, this is the one that started me on this path. I was picking tomatoes one day and I found a chrysalis on the bottom of my tomato. And what I didn't know what to do with it, so I, I, I thought, well, if I leave the tomato on the plant, it could fall and crush the caterpillar. So I got to bring it in. So I suspended it over a jar and I brought it in. I washed it every day, every day, and, um, and I got hooked. And that was when I decided, that was when I found out about the monarchs being in trouble and monarch way stations. And I decided that I would create a monarch way station for my garden. And then I decided I was going to get more people to make monarch way stations out of their garden. And um, I got started on this path. So that little guy is the one who started me on this path. So when you grow it, they will come. And uh, um, you know, why go to the trouble of raising monarchs? Well, only 1% to 5% survive in the wild. And you can tell any of my leaves that I have, there are little tiny holes, which means a caterpillar started and didn't make it. Um, Monarch-friendly habitats are good for all pollinators. So you're, you're benefiting the ecosystem. Um, monarchs make good poster children for the environment, I think, because their story is so appealing. And uh, as you can see, this little girl, um, one came, when they first come out, they're very docile. And uh, we were letting this one out, and it wasn't ready to fly yet, and it settled on her cheek. And it was just so cute. Um, so it's, the more we raise, the more we'll migrate. It's, it's a numbers game. It's a fascinating hobby. You get results in, in a month. And uh, if you do it right, you're doing no harm. Um, you meet the nicest people. And um, it might just change your life. Because I started on this, and then I decided I wanted to become a garden coach. And then I went and I got certified in, in master gardening, um, and it just snowballed. So uh, that's, it's pretty cool. So Monarch Raising 101, ready, set. So um, I show here my favorite tools and supplies. A lot of folks improvise with what they have. And I, rec I, I recommend, if you want to try this, and uh, you'll go home today with the tools to start trying this in, in terms of what you need to know. Uh, but start small. Some people get so excited and they're out picking leaves to feed their caterpillars and they see more eggs and more eggs. And next thing they know, they've got, they're raising 30 caterpillars and very hungry caterpillars need a lot of milkweed leaves. So then they're out getting more milkweed and they keep finding more eggs. And you're like, some can stay outside. Uh, so my must-haves. Um, I get these from a place called monarchbutterflygarden.net. It's not the only place that has them, but Tony is a guy who kind of, who really cares about this, and he's written a book about it, and he's just very, very knowledgeable, so I like to support him. But you can get these, you can find these different places. His, his I just think, are, they're very well made, and they're good quality. Um, so my uh, must-haves, I like these cages. I have a couple of them. This one comes, you'll see. It has a um, plastic uh, dish down on the bottom of it, which makes cleaning the cages, which you have to do once or twice a day, easy and quick. You just take it out, rinse it, put it back in. These are flat test tube racks, and these are floral tubes. So um, you, can, you can improvise, like some people put their floral tubes in little bottles, or, or some people just put their cuttings right in little bottles like this. But this is a system that works for me, and I raise maybe 75 a year. And so you can see they also come, they, now they make these little stands, and you can stand your tubes right in those yellow stands. Um, so uh, uh, also, unless you have really sharp eyes, I couldn't do without my magnifying glass. <laughs> You'll see why when I show you what the eggs look like. And um, um, so these are these are the basic these are the basic uh, things that you need. And uh, the next fun thing is egg collecting. And um, I have 
I'm always having people say, I can't find any eggs. And, I'm, and I come over, I say, I bet you I can find one. Um, so um, I want you to take a look. This, this leaf has an egg on it. And um, it's actually about ready to come out. So it's a little harder to seed when they're ready, uh, when they're getting ready to come out. Actually, there are two, two on here. When they're getting ready to come out, the um, top of the egg turns dark because that's the nose of the caterpillar pushing its way out. But uh, you'll see, I'm going to pass this around. You guys can pass it around, and you'll see the egg. Looks like a little pimple. And if you look at it with a really good loop, you will see, and I'll show you on the screen. Um, Did you see it right there sticking and out? Which one blended? Um, yeah, that, that's okay. a good one. Yeah, right there. You can see it. If you look at it in profile, you can see this little bump sticking out. And uh, that's it. So the tip of it is, is tapered, and it has ridges, and it looks pearly. And then as it's ready to come out, it turns dark. You know, that's the nose of the caterpillar, and it's turning dark, and it's more translucent. The shell is more translucent. And the first thing it does when it it sort of eats its way out of the shell, and then it eats the shell. Um, so its first meal is the protein from, from the eggs. And, uh, um, and you'll see how small it is. I, I highly recommend that anyone who has a uh, six-year-old, those their sharp little eyes, they're really good at finding eggs. So if you can, if you can recruit a six-year-old, you're golden. Um, they love looking for them. Sometimes you'll get uh, little droplets of sap on the leaf uh, because that's that's actually the milk the milky part of the milkweed and um, um, but that's where the loop comes in handy or the magnifier because the sap droplet doesn't look like it doesn't have a tapered point and uh, doesn't have this texture so that's that's how you can tell um, so uh, there's an extra step that I take which is I use a delete diluted solution of bleach um, and I tell beginners not to worry about that. I do that because I get like a 95% success rate with the ones I raise. For, I'm uh, being exacting that way. And uh, with, with this, uh, with the bleach, that gets me there, um, protects against a couple diseases. But you don't have to do it. So, so let's just say you rinsed your leaves. And um, when you've got your le when you've gotten your they start out, oh, let me start you with the, these guys. So you can see there's a couple that have hatched, and you can pass that around. There's, there's one that hasn't hatched, and there's a couple really tiny ones that have hatched in there. They're about the size of your eyelash when they first come out. And, uh, and, and, you, and, you, and people say, Oh, don't you have to poke holes in here? No, they'll, they'll escape if you poke holes. And just opening these a couple times a day is really all you need when they're this small. And I open them a couple times a day and check, check and see how things are going and put in fresh. So here, these guys, they hatched on um, the 20th. So you can see how big they get. So these, are two, these guys are two days old. Two days old. Two days old. Yeah. And, uh, and now we've got these guys are um, about a week old, so they graduate. I put them in a bigger box, but not in here yet because sometimes the bigger cats get very hungry and the little cats become dinner. Um, I think it's more of an accident when they're getting carried away, so I just keep the, the, the smaller guys do, do well. I know, and he is... He is molting. That's why he's up on the lid. He's not sick. And um, in a little bit, he also sheds his skin, and it's a little black skin, just like the final. Uh, so they molt um, in four stages because they grow so they change size so much. They shed their skin four times. They outgrow their skin, and they molt. And when they molt, they go still like this. So um, if I'm cleaning the cage and I've got one who's still like this, I, I you know, let them be, you know, just, just, just leave them alone. So we'll put, we'll put the lid back on this one. Um, oh, but I'll flip these guys over so 
they're often on the undersides of the leaves, which is more safe for them. So I'll just flip them over so now you can see everybody who's in. And, uh, and you can see the, the, the leaves stay pretty fresh, too, by, by virtue of having the lid kept on it like that. The le leaves, uh, um, they don't shrivel. And, and the ones with, like, the eggs, the eggs, are li um, the eggs are on those leaves for four days. So the leaf stays in there for four days um, uh, when the egg hatches. And it doesn't really shrivel that much in all that time because it's, it's enclosed. So then we have... The big boys. So I talked about cleaning the container. And again, this is all too much detailed to take you through every single step. Um, but I do keep the containers pretty clean because um, it's, it's, um, they can't, you know, disease could happen in a cage. So you just try to keep it clean. Um, so, whoops, did I? Oh, I'm going backwards. How did I manage that? Hang on. OK. Egg collecting, we did that. Cleaning the cage. Here's a, here's a guy who's molted, and you can see his skin next to him. He eats the skin. Oh. So they, the, after they finish molting, they eat the skin. So it's more protein for them. And um, oh, oh, yeah, I see what I did. I turned it around, so the back was, backward was forward. So this is, these are the different instars. You can see in size, the difference between the, the final one, the, what they call fifth instar, that's what turns into chrysalis. So there we go. OK. So by the time they're big enough to go here, they're about an inch and a half long. And that's when their appetites really uh, get going. And that's when you have to really stay kind of, you got to know where your next milkweed is coming from when they're this big, because you can, sometimes I'll come in in the morning, I'll be like, have you been partying all night? Because I, they were full, all the, the tubes were full in the morning. It's just devastation. <laughs> they just eat me, you know, just eating them out of house and home. So, so, you know, it's always good. I always have some milkweed in reserve that I've cut and ready, have ready to go. Um, now, some people say, oh, I found a caterpillar. Can I bring it in? Well, bringing in a caterpillar, a wild caterpillar, you can do it. They may, um, there are parasitic flies that um, can infest a caterpillar like that. And it can, it's, it's upsetting and kind of gross when your, your little chrysalis that you've nurtured instead of a beautiful caterpillar coming out, or a beautiful butterfly coming out, um, a yucky maggot comes out. Not what we want. So um, that's why I, if I see a wild one, I say, you know, God bless, good luck. I'm not bringing you in the house. So I just hatch from eggs. That way I know that they're healthy. Um, and so if you accidentally bring one in, if you're being really cautious, like I do sometimes, I raise them separately because I don't um, want something they might have gotten to infect the others. Uh, or sometimes if I really have a full house, I'll mix them in and hope for the best. But um, so it's not terrible to bring in one. Um, so um, this is, watch for cats getting ready to J. And we have one here who is obligingly modeling that behavior for you. Um, and. Uh, because I just moved him, he curled up tight. But he was in a J. And uh, this guy was crawling around this morning, house hunting, looking for a spot. He's made a, he's woven, they, wo they weave silk. And rather than pass this around, which is going to get this fellow a little upset, I'll leave it and you can take a good look at it afterwards. But he was hanging in a J by his tail. Um, uh, with a silk button that he has woven to attach himself to the roof. And um, uh, when, when they go like this, I can tell when they're about ready to make that final transformation into chrysalis uh, because they go from hanging in the J, uh, their, their antenna go limp. And that's because they've already started to withdraw out of their skin. The antenna is part of what gets left behind, the skin. So when the antenna are limp, I know the process has already started. And so if I really want to watch, I, I keep a close eye once, once that has happened. So this guy just went in as Jay since I got here tonight. So he will probably go into chrysalis tomorrow morning. So we won't get to watch him do it. Um, 
and I've been using the male pronoun, but actually I don't know. The first time you can tell if it's a male or female is, believe it or not, the chrysalis. You can tell on the chrysalis, and I have a picture here of it, and um, there is an extra kind of a seam on the female chrysalis that's not on the male, and that's where you bring over your little six-year-old with the sharp eyes. And you say, is it this or is it this? And they look and they tell you. So, um, or you're a very good magnifier. But uh, it is kind of cool to know that it's going to be a, a male or female even before they come out. Like this one here, I knew that it was going to be a female. So what I have here, you'll notice that I have chrysalises up on top. And I have caterpillars down below. I have put dates. I know when these guys are about to come out, I keep an eye out. Uh, I do move my caterpillars to a separate cage if I've got butterflies starting to emerge. The butterflies can infect caterpillars if they merge right over them. They, they drip out uh, some fluids when they um, emerge. And um, to be on the, again, this is you know me being careful, being on the safe side. I just move my cats to a different cage. If I, when I see one has turned dark, then this just becomes a adult butterfly cage. And the next class of graduates will finish their growing up in a different place. So about every week, because it takes a week for these guys to emerge, so about every week, I'm ready to switch cages so that everybody who climbs up here before the first one comes out will stay here. Everybody else gets moved to a different cage. So that is what happens. So then you're going to watch as you're raising them. You're going to come you know, up one morning the night before. You, you may have noticed, oh, it's been here for a week. Then you know, get ready, start watching. And here, um, it's interesting. So. What you've been seeing, the chrysalis green, overnight, and it's just so amazing, the pigmentation comes through and goes to orange and black, and the um, chrysalis itself is actually clear, like your fingernail. So it's showing the, the butterfly through. Uh, if you have a really good microscope, you can see, in, or a magnifier, you can actually see on the green chrysalis, you can see the shape of the wings and the shape of the body. And I've even seen a really good magnification video that showed you can see its heart beating inside the chrysalis, which is just mind blowing to me. OK, so last really important thing to make sure your butterflies get off to a safe start is when they first come out, see they have these little stubby wings. Think of it as a wrinkled shirt coming out of the laundry. If it's wet and wrinkled, if it doesn't dry straight, the wrinkles get stuck, right? Then the butterfly can't fly. So they know the first thing they do, the minute they get out, they've got about a minute to get in hanging position like this. They have to hang. They have to hang straight. And you can see they pump their abdomen and their wings pump bigger and bigger. So they come out with these little stubby wings, stubby wrinkled wings, uh, wrinkled, wrinkled wings that are wet. And, um, they, and in, in minutes, they're beautiful like this. And they need to hang for several hours. So I don't let them out of their cages till they've hung for several hours. Um, and um, this little lady, I think it's time. I kept her in here a little longer than I should have because I wanted to bring her here with me tonight. But she's ready. And. Here we come. So, yeah, they usually go and find a tree, especially since it's toward the end of the day. They usually go and roost in a tree overnight, and she'll figure out. I had flowers for her in case she got hungry, but she didn't touch them. They roost in trees, yes, overnight, yeah. Yep. So these are some of my resources. Again, these links are in, um, in, in, um, in, in the PDF that you'll get from Amanda. And um, uh, really some very good resources. There's a great Facebook. There are two wonderful Facebook groups I belong to. One is Raise More Monarchs, Less, Less Effort. Whoops. Overshot. There we go. 
Um, and this one is written by Tony Gomez, the guy who designs all these cages. But as I said, you don't have to. I'm not saying buy from him. Uh, I do because I like to support his efforts. But you can find these on online. You know, butterfly cage, Google butterfly cage, and you can uh, shop around. But anyway, so this is this is a, this is a great. This is the book I referenced about everything else that you might find on your milkweed. Uh, interesting book and um, so to sum up you got to have six hours of sunlight you need annual and perennial nectar flowers you need to plant natives uh, annual and perennial milkweeds um, and you want to go organic and uh, that is what the pollinator pathway is all about so my friends from the pollinator pathway came tonight uh, in case anybody isn't yet on the pollinator pathway and wants to sign up. And um, a Monarch Way Station, which I mentioned, the Way Station certification. I have to tell you, when I got interested in this was 2016. Um, there were 13,000 nationwide. There were nine in the state of Connecticut. So I became the 10th. And now there are 455. So, so go Connecticut. That's right, yes. So, um, and uh, again, you can go to Monarch Watch. This is the Monarch Way Station plaque, which you can put, uh, you'll see gardens are around uh, Fairfield County that have these plaques on their, on their gardens. And um, so um, I have free milkweed seeds here for you tonight if you'd like to take some home. And if any of you took my winter sowing or, my, or take my winter sowing class that I have in January to teach you how to sow them, because you can't sow milkweed now. You need to sow it in the winter. It needs a cold period, a period of cold stratification. And um, this is the close up on the boy and girls. And um, but that's really these are this is just fascinating. This, this is some trivia. Um, they gain 2,700 times their original weight. They travel um, between 1,500 miles a day on average. It can take them two months to get to make the full journey. Some of them start up in Canada and they've got down to Mexico. So that's a two-month process. Um, and uh, um, in my personal observation, they like whatever mom gave them. In other words, if mom laid them on common, they really like to eat common. If mom laid them on swamp, they really like to eat swamp. They'll eat what, if there's nothing else, they'll eat what you give them. But if you give them a choice, they go for the thing that they hatched on. It's the darndest thing. So, um, and this is all about how to get the certification. And it tells you, and basically, to get the certification, you, you have what I've been telling you to have in terms of your garden. Uh, it, but they have some specifics. And uh, it's a cool thing to do. Uh, this is the annual cycle. This just explains that there are generations. So um, the lady we just released is not going to make it to Mexico because she she's going to she will let the eggs she lays will be the ones who migrate to Mexico because uh, that'll be happening the beginning of September. The peak migration here in our latitude is between September 8th and September 20th. That's when almost any time you look up at the sky, particularly along the coastline, you'll see them and they're going south. Um, especially if you're someplace where there's a lot of goldenrod. Goldenrod is a really key flower for fall migrations. Big source of nectar. So that's, that's it. That's my talk. Um, thought you guys would be interested to know there is a monarch monitoring blitz. And you could take a picture of this sheet. But it's ha happening from July 23rd to August 1st. So you can just observe and report. And uh, they want to know about eggs and larvae, so now you know where to, how to look for eggs. You might be able to report that you saw eggs. They want to know where you saw milkweed, and they want to know where you saw adults. So um, starting on July 23rd, which is tomorrow, so check this out. And if, uh, if you've uh, learned to spot something as a result of this talk, it would be nice to enter. So this, this is Journey North. Is, the one that does most of the monarch tracking, and they're sponsoring this monarch watch. So they're trying to get, a f they're trying really hard to get a fix on what's going on with the population of monarchs because of what's been happening uh, around the country. So um, be great if you. So um, so that's it for for my talk. But if you wanted to come up and.
they're having a war right now over this one leaf. <laughs> I need to go home and put in more milk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, great talk. Thank you. I'm glad you guys enjoyed. Thank you for participating. In the summer, you have your house. Are they sensitive to temperature?